Well, if you please just grab your Bibles and go over to the book of Acts, chapter 7, where we had our reading. Uh, we had a bit of a truncated reading because we're going to be covering the large part of chapter 7, Stephen's defense. Uh, we're not going to go phrase by phrase because we'd be here till this evening. So if you would uh, just go over there, we're going to recap where we are and go forward from there. So chapter 7 picks up in the middle of Stephen's trial. And Richard started us on this track last, week, last Sunday. Uh, to recap, the latter part of chapter 6, Stephen had been debating in the synagogue. Stephen was one of the seven men chosen as deacons for the apostles. And he, as, he was in, as he was doing this, he'd run into a group of people who didn't really like what he was saying. Surprise, surprise. But at the same time, they didn't really have a better answer to argue with, so they began to look for a way to have him silenced altogether. Uh, essentially, in the modern vernacular, his comments got flagged for going against community standards. A moment of silence, please, as we mourn the fact that we probably understood that. So the synagogue is something we have not seen a lot of so far in the book of Acts. We spent most of our time with the apostles as they were in the temple and disputing with the religious authorities in the council chambers of the Sanhedrin. Uh, so about synagogues, some of the oldest evidence we have that mentions the synagogue system is in the third century BC. And there are some who think it emerged after the destruction of Solomon's temple because it, it left the Jewish people with a need for a place to practice their liturgy and teaching. And after the temple was rebuilt, the synagogue system remained and it existed side by side with the temple worship system. So like the temple, it was a place for worship. The synagogue was known as a house of prayer or a place of assembling. And some people think, say, actually, that the way we assemble as believers in the church has a lot more in common with the way the synagogue worked than it does in the way the temple worked, even though some of our brothers and sisters may argue with that. Uh, it was a place where the scriptures were read and teaching was heard. We saw this, for instance, in the life of Jesus on earth when he stood in the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah during the early days of his ministry. And the early church believers, much like their Lord, took up the same practice of going not just to the temple, but also into the adjoining system, the synagogue. And their purpose was to show from all the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, the community standards in the synagogue were somewhat loose at the time. So it was not to go against the rules for Stephen to debate the scriptures and to stand up and speak to the whole community. It was a common practice for someone to take up the scriptures, to read it aloud to those gathered, and to discuss it. So Stephen was doing just that when he landed himself into a place of disfavor with those who had influence in the synagogue. And they pulled their old trick of inciting other people to speak against him. And they brought him before the council at the temple. So there in this court, we're going to see yet another trial. Though it seems like we just got out of the last one. And after going through two with Peter and John, we may think we know what to expect, but this time it has a very different ending. So we start in verse one with the trial. It says, then the high priest asked him, are these things so? So for the last few verses in chapter six, it's been, it, the focus has been on the ones who brought him before the council and laid the charges against him. It, in this time, that narrative lens has been focused on what was being said about Stephen and not what Stephen had to say for himself. And before we follow that shift of the lens from what and to see what Stephen has to say, let's review what's been said against him. It, the charges are as follows. They said he was speaking against the temple or the holy place and reminded them of the words of Jesus when he said the temple would be destroyed and in three days he would raise it up. Now this is its own serious charge for them because the temple was the place where God was in residence. It was the presence of the temple that gave Israel 
their favor and a hope that God would re indeed return and reign from the Holy of Holies in the age to come. It was a marker of God's presence with Israel. And anything associated with the temple must be respected. It must have the highest reverence or it would bring judgment. Do you remember in the book of Daniel, for instance, when King Belshazzar used the cups from the temple for his feast and he brought judgment upon himself for using them in that way. And that story is what was in the mind of the Jewish people of how the temple was to be respected down even to the most trivial things as cups. Another thing we have to remember is that in the history of Israel, the destruction of the temple was always a sign of judgment against them. It was a sign that after they had left the true worship of God and strayed, his presence would leave the temple and with it, his protection would be withdrawn. So for Stephen to freely speak of a threat against the temple was a serious thing, dangerous business. To speak of its destruction made you subject to arrest and scourging, which actually did happen, according to Josephus, a number of years after this. The second charge they bring against him is that he's spoken against the law of Moses and that Jesus in his teaching had done away with the customs that were handed down to them. And scholars suggest that the customs they're speaking of are not only the commands laid out in the Torah, but also the rabbinic teachings around the law. These were oral teachings that they called fences to preserve the purity of the law of Moses, the way of life that was laid out for them. And the customs around, the Torah and the customs around it were unassailable in the minds of the people. And for us in the 21st century, this may be a little more difficult to understand because we love the idea of challenging tradition. We love the idea of throwing out older ways of doing things ever since the uh, enlightenment we've been doing that. We're a people used to that sort of thing. But for first century Eastern people to throw out the customs handed down by your ancestors is unthinkable, totally out of left field. It opens the door to total apostasy. So the fences they had built around the law were to keep them from plunging off of the metaphorical cliffs of what the law had said. So to depart from the tradition of your ancestors was a huge deal. It was to throw away everything your family had left to you. And it was to set yourself against the authority of the high priest in the Sanhedrin. So the high priest, in answering to these charges, gives Stephen, a chance to answer for himself. He says, are these charges true? Now, this would be the place where we would expect a not guilty or guilty plea, or maybe we'd expect Matlock to stand up and say, well, I got about that. It's where we expect a heroic speech proving the witnesses that have been brought against him were liars, as the scripture tells us they were, and they're thrown out of court. But that's not what happens. What happens instead is Stephen begins to speak and that narrative lens turns away from the council to the, the person on the witness stand and it focuses on him and he begins to tell a story. Now, we didn't read the entirety of the speech this morning because it is so long. Uh, John Stott actually commented that many people who look at the speech consider it to be a little bit rambling. And some fail to even see why he took the time to rehash Israel's history to the leaders of Israel, who would have been very familiar with all that he had to say. But he had a reason for this. He had a reason for telling this story to them at that moment. This wasn't to stall, it's not to buy himself more time. He was not rambling in order to derail the trial, but he was correcting the narrative. He was telling the story as it really was, not the story the witnesses and the council thought they knew. Do you all remember uh, To Kill a Mockingbird? I would really hope you do because it's pretty local to this area. Well, if you can call to mind either the book or the movie with Gregory Peck, depends on which one uh, you prefer. It doesn't really make a difference. The story is the same. Well, in the book, we meet this, the young girl, Scout, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, 
who was growing up in 1930s Alabama in a town where a man is accused by a girl of assaulting her. And Scout's father is the one who's tasked with defending this man. And as the trial progresses, what emerges is that there's two different versions of the story with two very different outcomes. The one that Mayella, the, the accuser, told, and her father in particular, are bent on pushing, is the one where the defendant, Tom Robinson, is at guilt. A story of a man making unwanted advances toward a young woman, and when he was rebuffed, he turned to violence. That was their story. Robinson, however, told a very different story. His was similar to that of Joseph in Potiphar's house, of this woman making advances to him only to be pushed away, and when her father found out, her father was the one who inflicted the violence. And the outcome of the story, the outcome of that man's life depended on which story they could prove was true. Which story told things as they really were. And I'm sure you also remember that the direction the jury chose was not influenced so much by the truth, but as to by their own racial prejudice. And Robinson was not even given a fair chance to be believed. And, and because in their mind, the story could only have gone one way. They only understood the story in their lens. And the story that Stephen tells the Sanhedrin is very different from the story that they believe. They believe they're on the right side of history. They're the ones who are safeguarding the dwelling place of God and his word. They're the ones who are keeping the outside sex from corrupting the truth with their false doctrine. They're the gatekeepers, standing in the line of their ancestors against any aberrant way that seeks to take Israel away from the worship of God. The story they believe is one where Jesus was not the Messiah and all who follow him are guilty of blasphemy. But the story Stephen tells is very different. It shares all of the same elements of their story, the patriarchs, the promises of God, the covenants, the prophets, but it also brings out a couple of important points out of the story. The first main point is that throughout the history of the people of God, the Lord has always been with them. No matter where they roamed, from Abraham wandering through the land, to Joseph and his descendants in Egypt, to the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness until they came to the promised land, in every major moment in the history of their ancestors, God was with them. And the thing is, he was not bound to a geographical location. He's never needed a house made with human hands. His glory has always rested with his people where they were because he is the living God, not like the gods of the people around them who needed temples and images to abide with them. But the God of Israel is the God who moves with his people, who's making a temple out of his people, a living temple. The second main point is that throughout Israel's history, they've consistently turned away from God and his word. He argues that essentially the custom of their ancestors has been to turn away from Yahweh toward idols over and over again. From their time in the wilderness to the prophets, they have consistently turned away from the Lord. This is a very different story than the one that they believed. And much like the residents of the fictional town of Maycomb, Alabama, they had already decided which story they wanted to believe. And they brought the guilt upon themselves. So Stephen, at the end of this passage, has told his story. He's made his defense in the trial. And though he is not the one being put to the test, uh, uh, rather, even though he is the one being put to the test, now he shifts over from plaintiff to judge, and he delivers the verdict. It says in verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You can tell he really knew how to make friends and influence people. You are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? 
They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that receive the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. Those those certain terms he uses, you find consistently through the prophets, stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart. The language accuses them of acting, turning away from God and embracing the way of the heathen, acting just like everybody else. And as he drew his defense to a close, he tightens the focus on them because they were indeed upholding the customs that had been passed down because just like their fathers, they had resisted the Holy Spirit and rejected the Messiah. They, like their fathers before them, had been privileged. They had been handed down the very word of God, preserved for them throughout the centuries, and still they chose to walk another way. They chose to deny God's leading. They chose to cling to their customs, their sacred cows, instead of seeing what God was doing in the present tense instead of the past tense. What Stephen is saying is this pattern of behavior God has again and again offered deliverance from. He's offered freedom to them. He set them free from bondage and slavery in Egypt. He rescued them from captivity and exile, but still they reject him. Then he sent his son, Jesus, the righteous one, the one who would bring ultimate justice to the world, but they had brought injustice down upon him. And in their rejection, they handed him over to the pagan authorities. Again, they had rejected God's rescue. Again, they've rejected God's favor. And oh, what a dangerous place to be. Now, it must have been easy for them to stand there looking at Stephen and to seeing him totally in the wrong and themselves totally in the right. It must have been hard to see it any other way because for so long they believed that they were right that they alone held the way to the truth. And they were so adamantly sure that they closed their ears and hardened their hearts to this other way, the way that was proclaimed by Jesus and his followers. And so the verdict is that in their pride, they had condemned themselves. They stood on the wrong side of God's law, outside the path of obedience. The very same crime that they were accusing Stephen of they were the ones who were resisting God. Now, it's pretty easy to say that things haven't changed much, have they? Throughout history, humanity has always stood on the other side of the ways of God. And outside of Christ, outside of the new heart and new mind that he gives us by his grace, we too always resist the Holy Spirit. We always tell our version of the story a version in which we're the heroes and bear no guilt. We've done everything we can to silence that voice of guilt within. Our our culture has done a remarkable job of this, actually. We've all turned away from worshiping the true God and instead took to worshiping the creatures rather than the creator. We fashioned our idols of wealth, power, class, sexual gratification at any cost and in any way. We've heaped unto ourselves decadence and excess at every turn. We built a world founded on greed, deception, malice, and selfishness, and somehow we call it flourishing and happiness. We've rejected God's design for humanity, male and female, to better suit our own untoward appetites. In our culture, these things are no longer sins, just repressed parts of who we really are. They're not outside of God's design, they're just part of our truth. We've set aside his way of doing things and hid ourselves from his presence. And just like our ancestors in the garden, We weave together our own aprons to cover ourselves, to hide ourselves from the Holy Spirit, to hide ourselves from the light of the truth. The verdict for our world is the same as it was then. The guilt of rejecting his way and the Messiah rests upon us all. But there's another part to Stephen's story. And this is part of the unspoken part. This is the part that's in between the lines. 
because as Stephen was telling the story of the people of God, what we can see throughout that whole history is the patience and steadfast love of God. Because time and again, he came to their rescue, set them free from bondage and delivered them from their own self-destruction. He's always made a way. He's always extended the hand of mercy. Because in, in Jesus, the ultimate mercy had been given and steadfast love had been shown. In him, there is freedom and deliverance from those patterns from our ancestors, the ways mankind has rejected them. Like them, we do not need to resist the Holy Spirit. Because of what Jesus has done in his life, burial and resurrection, there is a way to break the cycle, to hear afresh the voice of God. The story does not need need to be told with us on the wrong side of it. We do not need to surrender our world to the broken paths of sin. We do not need to leave the world outside stuck in the path of our ancestors. We can intervene like Stephen by daring to tell the story how it really is. So how is the story? Well, it goes like this. Mankind since the beginning had a purpose. So many people feel purposeless today. God always has a purpose for each and every person from the very beginning. And it was not to be the mindless slave of a cosmic despot, but to be a partner, an active participant in the creation. Mankind was made in his image, male and female, and given a job to do. They were to be the ambassadors of God to the earth, to gather up the worship of creation and offer it afresh to the look to the Lord, sorry, to tend the garden as God had made by bringing order to the disordered places of this world. And mankind left that purpose when they decided that they would rather be their own gods and took knowledge for themselves that they were not ready for and abandoned their post. The disorder of sin began to spread and it's confused every aspect of who we are. And since the beginning, God had a rescue mission starting even with the first parents, that he would deliver them through the seed of a woman. And he always delivered his people in spite of their disobedience. He called the people to himself. He raised up from them one who would be the image of God as it was meant to be, one who would be a human as it was meant to be. But to do this, he had to do it himself. He took, and by becoming the son of God in human flesh. And he took on the pain, sorrow, and brokenness of the, and disorder that sin had caused. And now he opened the door, not just to a select group of people, but to all who would come to him, all who would seek to step away from the broken paths that have been handed down. One who wants to step into the story as it really is the story as it should be. Not one of rejection, guilt, and destruction, but one of life and steadfast love. God could have given up at, on humanity at any time and he would have been perfectly just in doing so. He could have let them go to do their own thing. But instead, as our liturgy says, when they had rebelled, his love remained steadfast. Now, it can be easy in our day to focus only on the negative things we see. It would be easy to point our fingers to those who are trapped in the other version of the story. But if we were to focus on that, to close our eyes to the big picture, would we really be any better off than the high priest of the Sanhedrin? After all, the living manifestation of steadfast love of God stood in front of them. And in the blindness of their own tradition, they condemned him to death. There's no really an easy way to say this, so we'll just go for it. We must be so careful that we don't get lost in our own knowledge of the Bible, that we lose sight of the big picture. So focused on the commands that we forget the heart of the one who gave them. You know, we're Westerners. We love our lists. We love our lists. 
Nobody else in the world could have come up with spreadsheets. We had to do it because we're obsessed with things like that. We like our rules. We like our regulations. And sometimes we treat this as if it's just the rules and regulations. This isn't a book of rules. This is a story. The story of God's love toward humanity. A story that tells us he's not going to leave us to our own devices. It's so easy to condemn. So easy. It's so easy to stack up Bible verses against whatever you want to focus on at the moment. But when we do that, we lose sight of the big picture. Don't forget, as Paul said, such were some of you. And if it wasn't for the washing and cleansing that Jesus has done by the Holy Spirit, we would all still be there. And we would all still be the ones who reject the Holy Spirit. But God didn't leave us there. And he didn't leave us without the real version of the story, the story as it really is. So even in this harsh indictment that Stephen has delivered, we can see the steadfast love of God running like a river throughout history. So on this day, when we stand in front of a culture that's moving so far away from God's design, so far away in the other direction, are we willing to focus not on the negative, but on the positive? Do we see this as a challenge? Do we see this as an opportunity for God's grace to triumph? Are we willing to focus on the steadfast love of God that's flowing toward them through us? Are we willing to look not on the condemnation ahead, but on the forgiveness that flows from the cross? Is the song on our lips that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases? No matter how far we've gone, no matter what we have done, he has made a way. And that's the story as it really is. Amen. Please stand.